It is our last sermon on discipleship. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, we've certainly uh, spent a lot of time uh, working on this, and uh, you know, hopefully our, our guidebook will be out next uh, year, and we're excited about that as well. So the five steps of discipleship, uh, if you think about these, are number one, you ready? Uh, J, for Jesus, we all need Jesus. And again, that seems simple because if we're going to think about discipleship, it's turning our lives around and following something or someone else. But we already know the secret. It's not just a higher power. We know who the higher power is, and that's Jesus Christ. So that's who we're going to go follow, right? And then the E is everyone needs relationships, right? Because you, you need that relationship with God, and you need the relationship with other people. And this is where we remember it's about the relationship, not the rules. Or we sometimes like to say there's a, a big R, relationship, and there's a little R, rules. And we always want to make sure that the, the big R, the relationship, is that more important than the little R, the rules, or even the little R, religion. Sometimes we get that in there mixed up too, right? And so we have J E S. All right, anybody remember what the S is? Safeguard. Safeguard. I hope you can get it behind you. <laughs> Just seeing if you know who could really read was what we were testing there, right? Safeguard your relationships then. All right. And so the idea here is that we're creating safeguards around our relationships because why? Because the first thing that's going to derail you is friends that you. Maybe once had or still have who go, I don't like the new you. You broke the system. You no longer do all the stupid stuff that we used to do. Right? And then we remember there are some relationships we have to begin to put boundaries around, right? To safeguard who we are and who God is and our relationship with them. And we do that because we know that there is an enemy who wants to steal our heart. That's why next week we start the new sermon series, The Battleground for the Heart. And then we have the U, which is understanding, right? And this is really where we go, hey, we, we really need to become theologians. Now, when I say theologians, I don't mean we all need to become professors and teach at a university. But theology is the study of God, and we should all have theology. In fact, you all do. You just don't call it theology very often. But it is where we need to understand who God is. And again, remember, if you think of God as this kind of big, mean, absent father, well, your discipleship's going to fall apart in a hurry because you're not following the real God, right? And then today, we move into what is one of my favorite things to talk about, which is sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace. That's the S. Sanctifying grace. And... Here's what I want you to know. Uh, I talk to people on a regular basis who say, once they start following Jesus, I'm ready to give up. Do you know why they're ready to give up? Because they come to me and say, I just can't do it. And I go, do what? I can't follow all the rules. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I want to go, you need to go back to step two. Right? But here's the problem. Once you start following Jesus... Right? Somehow we begin to think it's once again about the rules. Do you know why? It's because you want to be in charge again. And if it's about the rules, you get to be in charge. Because now you're working out your own salvation and you're doing it. And then the relationship with Jesus gets off course. And your salvation gets lost in the midst of that. Because you're no longer living under grace. You're living under the law, Paul would say, of the Old Testament. Now, remind you that your relationship with Jesus has rules, right? Has boundaries, right? But if I'm focused on just keeping and staying in love with Jesus, the rules will just happen, right? <coughs> I don't ever sit down with my wife and go, all right, let's go over all 829 rules of our relationship. It just doesn't happen. Because why? Because she would add more every day, right? Instead, I just go, baby, I'm just going to focus on madly loving you, and I want you to every day go, I am his world. And I go, if I do that, I'm going to be okay. And so far, it's working good. Right? Why? Because if I just focus on the relationship, the rules happen. But here's what happens. We begin to follow Jesus, and then we begin to kind of, i got to work out my own salvation. And here's why this is such a difficult thing, because there is a piece that's our effort. 
And what happens is we, we mix up what part is ours and what part's God. God's part is the grace. Your part is the surrender. Let's pray. We'll dismiss. <laughs> right? I mean, that's really all we need to say right there, right? Our part is to say, God, I surrender you every day. I receive your grace. Chuck's like, hey, this would be awesome. We're just leaving right now, right? <laughs> so here's kind of the image I want you to have. Okay? Hey, we come on up here and hold this for me. You look better than I do. <laughs> All right, go stand right here. There you go. Okay, this is Haley taking out her garbage. Everybody see Haley taking out her garbage? Yeah. Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> this is how this works. God comes along and says, What you doing? Haley would say, I'm taking out my garbage. I'm trying to fix my life. I'm trying to get it clean. I'm trying to get my house. I'm trying to get my house organized. That's the biblical term. All right, our bodies are a temple of God or a house of God. She's trying to get her house cleaned up. She's getting her garbage out. The problem is, is that she can't really do it. You can't clean your own house. You can't do it. Now, here's what happens is, is that Jesus comes along and then says, those look pretty heavy. How many people should hold those? Not much longer. Jesus comes along and says, you know, my burdens are light. And what he's saying is, is my pathway, what I offer you, is light. My trade. <clears throat> Haley says, I gotta do this in order to be able to get my relationship right with you, Jesus. I mean, I gotta get my house cleaned up so that I can get right with you, Jesus. That's why I'm doing I'm trying to get this relationship thing right with Jesus. I'm cleaning my house so that I can get things right with you, Jesus. And Jesus is like, you, you can't, you'll never, you'll never succeed. What I'm offering you is a trade. Would you trade? Now, here's, what, here's what Haley may do, and this is what often we do, is we lay our burdens, our junk down at Jesus' feet, right, and take the bit of grace he has, right? We're shaking about that. Now, here, here's what we do is that we take a bit of Jesus' grace, but we still operate saying, but I, I still want to clean out my own house. And what we, what we don't understand is Jesus has unending grace, doesn't he? He's like, I see you got two hands. You want to give me those burdens and that junk too? <laughs> what happens if she gives me that junk? She loses control of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord have mercy right there. Right? Mm -hmm. We lose you. And, and, and sometimes we do this game. Thank you. Those are much lighter, aren't they? Right? And we offer all this back to Jesus' feet. And then and then, then what happens is a little bit later, Haley begins to go, I need, I, I really gotta get my life cleaned around. She's like, Jesus, let me give you back your grace. I wanna, I wanna grab my burdens back. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? Well, I, I, I need to get my house straightened up. I need to, Jesus is like, no, you don't understand. The whole goal of this was you surrender your junk to me and you live in my Grace, which is much lighter. But you can't grab onto my grace if you're going to hold your junk. Amen? Thank you. All right, so here's my thought for us. You ready? You got that image in your head? This is how most of us look. I can't be good enough. It's exhausting carrying around all this junk, right? Trying to get it fixed and trying to be perfect, right? And, and we just can't do it, right? I mean, I mean, I look at Sally, she's as close as we got to perfect, and she, oh, it's, a, it's a burden, right? Right? And so here's what I want to see. We feel like we're pushing this boulder up the hill all the time, right? And we feel like we're doing it on our own, and we're never going to get to the top, and sometimes we can't even move it forward. It's falling back on us, and we're going to be crushed by the weight of the perfection standard that Jesus set with us because we forget the last step of discipleship is sanctifying grace where Jesus calls us to surrender our burdens, our junk, our lives to him. 
and receive his grace, which transforms our hearts. So think of it like this, ready? Sanctifying grace. Grace is the incredible, undeserved kindness God shows us through Jesus. Now, I like that definition, but it was a little short. I felt like maybe it wasn't quite as strong as it needed to be. All right? But I did like it, and so I went with a different one. All right? The free, unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and bestowal. Whew, went all the way back to the word bestowal. <laughs> Powerful, right? The bestowal of blessings. It is the kindness of God that we don't what? Deserve. 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 And isn't this what we do all the time with God? Like, I don't deserve your love. I got to work for it. I got I to gotta, I gotta prove myself worthy of your love, Jesus. And Jesus is like, that can't be done. I just need you to let it go and surrender, right? There is nothing we have done or ever can do to earn his favor. It is a gift from God. Oh, amen? Yes. All right? So sanctifying grace, to sanctify something means to make it holy. So as we move into the fifth stage of discipleship, what we have to recognize is God's already made you holy. You don't have to do it again to get there. Well, when did that happen? When you gave your life to Jesus and said, I'm going to begin to follow you. Jesus said, I've washed you in the blood of the Lamb. And we use a symbol of baptism to remind ourselves of Jesus washing us, right, and cleansing us and making us pure and holy, right? To sanctify something means to make it holy and declare it holy. I love this idea that it's not only made holy, but it's declared holy, because sometimes I, I, need, I need someone to step out and say, I know he was a mess in the past, but I made him pure. Oh, what a gift of freedom, right? Because we're all in a Sin Addiction Recovery Program, right? It's called Discipleship, Following Jesus. And for Jesus to declare, I, I know what he did, <laughs> but I made him holy again. That's an amazing gift. And by the way, that's the job of the church, is to pronounce that over other people. I want you to know that God accepts you, but then his grace is going to transform you, and then we're going to declare you holy every single day. Amen? We are unable to sanctify ourselves. Therefore, it's God's work of grace transformation. Why is this so important? Well, because if you were able to sanctify yourself, you'd also be able to unsanctify yourself. And then you would also be able to what? Earn God's grace. Which means you'd also be able to unearn God's grace. The power of that is recognizing that there's nothing I've ever done to earn it. Therefore, I can't unearn it. Therefore, there's nothing I can do to be a worse kid of God, and suddenly he's like, I don't love you anymore, sorry. Nor can I do anything to make God love me anymore. Right? Because I've been sanctified through the blood of Jesus. The grace of God then, and this is the power of it, trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and transforms our passion for the things of God. It changes our passions. The things that I once wanted, that I once thought were so dear. I no longer think they're valuable. And all I want is you, Jesus, only you. Wow. That's what sanctification is. That's why no matter where you're at in your discipleship journey, you're, you, you, we don't reach perfection, right? God's perfect. We're always being perfected. We're always being in that movement of holiness, of sanctification, right? But if you talk to someone who is further along in that process, the sins that we're working on, all the people are like, really, that's what your big deal is? And you're like, yeah, because that's where God is at with me right now. This that you think is so small, I think is huge. Why? Because it's harming my relationship with Jesus. And they're like, well, I'm back here working on this. And you're like, great, amen, God has sanctified you too. And we never have the ability to look down. Ever meet Christians that you wonder if they've experienced God's grace? Right? I've been to churches where I walk in and I'm like, I don't know if Jesus has been here or not. I mean, I think maybe the Grinch just go Christmas stop by. Right? And the ugly stick got and ran through the room a couple times here, but I don't know that Jesus' grace and love would stop by, right? Or as Ray Stevens would say, there sat Sister Bertha. I used that reference on the marriage tree. A whole group of kids didn't know who I was talking about. I said, you guys are in danger of going to hell. You need to educate yourself or else you could be in jeopardy right there, right? 
Now, this is what I'm talking about. If God's grace has transformed you, we hold one another accountable. We love one another. We even judge. Why? Because that's what we're called to do. We're called to judge things as wrong, right? Wrong, right? And if you stick your baby in the microwave, I judge that as bad. <laughs> right? And so when someone says to me, we should never judge, I go, what book are you reading for? It's just whatever I judge, whatever standard I judge by, Jesus says, that's what I'm going to hold you to. He doesn't say don't judge. He just says, careful. Right? And here's, here's how I know people who are further along in their discipleship in the sanctification process and people who are really working hard to follow the rules is by the amount of grace that spills out of their life. And you know what I'm talking about, right? So let me give you two thoughts. You went to Grandma's house. Grandma likes to clean house. Grandma has white carpet because grandmas have white carpet. I don't know why. That's what they do. All right? All they do is walk around barefoot all day. They never go play in the mud like the kids, but grandma's got white carpet, right? The kid comes in, he's all muddy, he runs through, and he's destroying stuff, right? And the parents are sitting there like, oh. and you're rushing over, trying to get him outside, and you're apologizing. And I have two views of grandma. Grandma's going to stop and say, hey, in the future, let's not do that. But I want you to know I love seeing you have fun. And I love, I just I want you to know that I love you, but we still have some things we're going to change. Or it's the grandma who loses her mind. And now you never want to go back to her house. Listen, this is how churches behave. People show up, they don't know what to do. The sanctified church, the one that's in God's grace, is like, you made a mess. We're going to help you know what to do better next time, but we love you. Let's keep getting right. And thanks for being with us and we're part of the family. The church that lives by the rules, not the grace, is I, hey, and then you never want to go back, right? Okay, so let's take a look at this. When we talk about sanctification, we're really talking about Romans 12, 1 through 2, right? Paul says this, therefore, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So when we talk about sanctification, we who have been sanctified are now offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. Hint, hint, the key word there is you surrender your body when it's a living sacrifice, right? We're back to, do I give up all this and receive the balloons God has me? The grace that God has for me, right? Or do I want to be in control, right? And so the key phrase here is a living sacrifice. You are to be a living sacrifice. This comes out of Leviticus 17, 11, and it talks about the life of a creature, right, is in the blood. It is given as an atonement for the sins. A living sacrifice comes out of this passage in Leviticus 17, 11. It makes atonement for one's life. And then Jesus comes along, and what's John say? John says about Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Now, if you're following Scripture, right, what you see in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of what's coming in the New Testament. We use the Lamb in the Old Testament, but it couldn't quite cut the mustard. Why? Because something eternal had to die for something temporary. In our us, right? And only something eternal could pay the price for something that was eternal, our sin. And so the Lamb never quite did it. And so Jesus comes along as the Lamb of God. Now this is important, and why this is such a big deal is because there's a whole movement in other churches, and Michael spoke about this just a bit, that we always want to be a church that speaks the truth. This is from uh, people who uh, don't believe that Jesus should have died for our sins, that Jesus needed to die for our sins, but they say... If God forgives all the time without requiring that they shed blood, and I'm really glad that people forgive me without asking, I open a vein or kill myself or my cat for them, okay? So I can offer forgiveness without shedding blood, and so the other people, what is going on with God? So the person saying, but if I can forgive without shedding the blood, why, why do we don't need a God who does that? That's not really what the Bible's teaching. The Bible's not really teaching that God needed to shed blood and forgive. He could have just said, I forgive. It goes on. All right? This, by the way, is from redeeminggod.com because apparently God needs redeeming. 
right? Matthew, tw that should have been like the first tip off, like redeeming God. That's not good, right? right? Matthew says, the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served, excuse me, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Same website says, if God is the one making the rules and sin is a serious threat to his holiness, then why did he decide that blood would appease him? Why not require, I don't know, spit or hair? Which is a great idea, unless you're bald. And you're just out of luck, right? Why didn't God just simply say, without the cutting of hair, there can be no forgiveness of sins? Pause. Hopefully you're sitting here going, something's not right with this theology. But would you know what to say against it? This is part of the apologetic training part of what it means to be part of the United. night. I'm going to help you out. Okay? It is true that you and I can forgive sins without any bloodshed. Do you know why you can do that but God can't? You and I aren't holy and righteous. In fact, no one's ever accused me of that because I'm not, right? In fact, I'll, I'll let some stuff go that I shouldn't let go. I'll ignore stuff just because I'm like, I don't want to care about it. I don't want to make it a big deal, right? Because I'm not holy and righteous. But our God is holy and righteous. And if he overlooks one thing, is he holy and righteous anymore? And if he overlooks three things, is he holy and righteous anymore? And if God overlooks one thing, why not overlook more things? And then what becomes the standard? Everybody almost as good as Mother Teresa gets in? Or do you just have to be better than Hitler? Which, by the way, I like that standard. I can do that. If it's Mother Teresa, I might not make it. So the key is, is that you and I aren't holy and righteous, and the author who's writing these things doesn't have in mind a holy, righteous God. He has in mind a God who just can overlook and forgive and dismiss sins. But the holy, righteous God said, I had to come and give my life as a sacrifice, an atonement through the shedding of blood. The author goes on to say that the, the death of Jesus wasn't even because God demanded it, but because the devil demanded it. What? What did the devil get in charge of it then? Right? Now, here's a pause. This is theology that's easily accessible. All I did was Google, why did Jesus die? Redeeming God came up. This is what we are confronting in our culture. And so when we ask, when someone asks, well, how are you sanctified? It's not by your good works unless you're following this guy. It is through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he gave his life on the cross for you. Romans 12, 1 through 2 again. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. What do you mean by that, Paul? We said, don't behave the way it will. You're not trying to earn your salvation. You can't live that way. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and perfect will for you. And so what Paul is saying is when you begin to follow Jesus, the sanctification process changes you. Why? Because you're so madly in love with God, you're chasing after God. Again, all those things that you once thought were so important, like, man, they're not such a big deal anymore. I'm just following God with all my heart, right? So what causes my heart to change? My efforts? I must be good enough. It turns grace into works. You're pushing the boar up the hill still. Or God sanctifies us and God causes us to desire him more than anything else. I love it. Right? Just, I got this. All you got to do is follow me. I'm doing the work. Right? God's doing the work, not us. All we're doing is surrendering and falling deeper in love with God. That's what sanctification is. Continually falling deeper in love with God, surrendering our will to His. He does the work of sanctification. Psalm 51, 10 through 12 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Right? The psalmist is saying, I can't do it. Only you, God, can create in me a pure heart. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. And I love it. He says, don't cast me away from your presence, Lord. Why? Because that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to chase you. I'm trying to get closer to you, right? Or take your Holy Spirit from me, but rather restore to me the joy. 
joy of my salvation. And grant the willing spirit in me to sustain it. Right? The joy of following the Lord, the joy of saying you are changing, transforming all the things that I once thought were important and all the junk I had. There's a reason I got the brace out of the trash can, folks. It's because what I once thought was junk, God says, yeah, but look what I've done with it. I've made all your junk grace. And what you once thought was hideous, I've made beautiful. Amen? Alright. So work says I have to clean up my life. Mm, not going to work, is it? Grace, on the other hand, says, hey, I need to let go of my garbage. And grab on to the grace of Jesus Christ with everything I got. And if you do that, I promise you, it'll be a right. Amen? <coughs> so step five, sanctification. My question for you today is, are you going to let go of your junk and accept the grace of God? Or are you going to try to work it out on your own? One of these is doomed to exhaustion and failure. One of these is doomed to exhaustion and failure. One of these is the life of abundance that Jesus promised when he said, I've come that you may have life life everlasting. Let's chase after Jesus. Amen? Will you pray with me? Holy Lord Jesus, may we surrender to you daily. May we take up our cross and follow you. May we give our junk to you and just say, Father God, bless us and call us to your holy name. O oh God, who gave his blood on the cross to sanctify us, may we praise you evermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, who are in the process of being sanctified. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.